Oftentimes, we feel overwhelmed with our circumstances. Making it difficult to simply put one foot in front of the other. Well, I realized this firsthand when I started to feel the effects of Friedrich's ataxia. Literally, making it more and more difficult to put one foot in front of the other. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. And for several years, I didn't do anything. In hindsight, I believe that if we don't know which direction to take, we must, at the very least, make a move. And make that effort to keep on moving. Once we build some momentum, there's no limit to what we can accomplish. When I was young, I drifted along like all happy kids. And I was genuinely happy. I had a loving family, lots of friends, and plenty of sports and activities to keep me busy. It seemed like nothing was standing in the way of my perfect low-key life. Breaks through school, low stress work, retirement at age 60, right? The American dream. Well then, I hit a roadblock. At age 17, I was diagnosed with Friedrich's ataxia. Friedrich's ataxia, what the heck is that? I could hardly pronounce it, let alone know what it would mean for me and my family for the rest of our lives. Well, over the next few years, my family and I found out that Friedrich's ataxia is a genetic progressive neuromuscular disease that affects all muscle coordination from the toes to the fingertips. We found out that it would only be a matter of time before I'm in a wheelchair. It would only be a matter of time before I lose all ability to take care of myself. And it would only be a matter of time before my heart fails and I suffer a premature death. Now, I don't know about you, but in my book, it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> to make matters worse, there's no treatment, no cure, and no hope. And I was 17 years old. 17? That's the pinnacle of optimism. Your whole life is in front of you. And I found out that it was nothing but downhill from there on out. So I lived with those facts for a few years. I graduated high school, went to college at UC Davis, got a degree in civil engineering, and got a good job in Sacramento, California, where I lived at the time. All the while, I was losing the ability to perform in sports I loved. Sports like baseball, basketball, golf and skiing. When it came time for me to give up my upright bicycle, I put my foot down. I said, that's enough. That's enough of losing all these sports and activities that mean so much to me. And I found a way to keep riding. I found a recumbent tricycle. My first thought was, tricycle? It's kind of lame. <laughs> Tricycles are for clowns and little kids. <laughs> but I was up against this roadblock, this situation that life had thrown my way. And this was my opportunity to make my move. So I went for a test ride. And as I was rolling around in the parking lot, 
I absolutely fell in love with the freedom that came with this new machine. It was freedom I hadn't felt in years. And I started writing. My first ride was seven miles. Seven miles, I was so proud of myself. I had no idea I had that in me. My next ride was 14 miles, then 25, then 50. Then only four months after my very first ride, I went for a century ride, 100 miles in a day. What was I thinking? <laughs> well, once again, I was up against this roadblock, this situation that life had thrown my way. And this was my opportunity to make a move. Well, I was the last one on the road that day. All the other cyclists had finished their ride, packed up their bikes, and were driving home. Heck, some of them were probably retired and were collecting the Social Security <laughs> by the time I crossed the finish line. But I'd done it! A hundred miles in a day? Are you kidding me? I can't even walk down the street! And I just rode a hundred miles in a day. From then on, the sky was the limit. I started thinking huge. I decided that I wanted to ride my trike to a national meeting for people with ataxia. Well, that year the meeting was in Memphis, Tennessee. And at the time I lived in California. What a crazy idea. But once again, I was up against this roadblock, this situation that life had thrown my way. And I knew with confidence that this was my opportunity to make a move. So on January 22nd, 2007, my dad and I left from San Diego, California. We were going to ride our bikes to Memphis, Tennessee. 2,500 miles. And 59 days later, we rode by Graceland. We rode our bikes to Elvis's house. <laughs> Talk about all shook up. <laughs> so I found my way to keep moving, to make my move. And I ended up with an amazing journey. And on that journey, I learned something. I learned that it's not all just about me. I began to receive I began to receive all these emails from people living with FA telling me how telling me how my actions were helping them in their life. And I totally forgot what my next line is. <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me. Well, I, my <laughs> so I began receiving all these emails, and people were telling me how my actions were helping them in their life. The momentum kept building, and the rides grew. This was bigger than just me. 
We went for two more trips. One from Sacramento, California to Las Vegas, Nevada. And one from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. And we decided to invite people with us. And we began to raise money. Well, actually, we did a lot more than just begin. In those three rides, we raised a total of $430,000 for FA Research. The momentum was building. This, this movement was spreading throughout the FA community. And so, along with three friends, I assembled a team that would compete in the Race Across America. Now, Race Across America is a 3,000 mile bike race, literally from ocean to ocean, from San Diego, from San Diego, California to Annapolis, Maryland. And this race is a little different. It's known as the toughest bike race in the world, the world's toughest bike race. And it's a little different because it's different than a stage race. A stage race, the, ra the riders ride every day as hard as they can, and then they get to go to bed at night. They get to sleep in their hotel. But this race, the clock starts when you leave Oceanside, California, and it does not stop, period, until you cross the finish line in Annapolis, Maryland. We had a four-man team, and here's the catch. With a team, you have to finish in less than nine days. That's 216 hours. That would mean that we had to ride 24 hours a day at no less than about 14 miles an hour the entire time. Put on top of that the fact that two of our teammates, me and one of the guy, we both have Friedrich's ataxia. The energy deprivation disease that's supposed to keep us from doing things like this. So get this. You wake up at 4 a.m. after two and a half hours sleep. And first of all, you try and remember where you are. <laughs> Then, you get dressed, scarf a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for fuel, and ride as hard as you can in the rain, in the dark, in the middle of Indiana. <laughs> then repeat, sleep, scarf, ride, sleep, scarf, ride. I never want to see another peanut butter and jelly sandwich <laughs> in my life. But it wasn't peanut butter and jelly that fueled our team across the country. It was purpose. About a week before the race, I got an email that said, Dear Kyle, I wanted you to know that one month ago today, my 12-year-old daughter Natalie was diagnosed with FA. I look online and I can't find much hope. But every time I see your team, you give me such hope. Thank you for f making this mother realize that a cure is possible before it's too late for my sweet baby. Now folks, who needs peanut butter, right? That's what drove us across the country. That's what fueled us during the 4 a.m. rainy shifts. And we kept moving. Now, during the race, Lots of people in the FA community came out to meet us along the way, and they 
drove hours just to see us. They would drive for hours and then they would wait for hours just to see us for like five minutes before we had to take off and keep moving. The one that sticks out of my mind is Jack. Jack and his family came out to meet us about 100 miles from the finish line. It was day eight, and I was tired, sore, and crabby. I rolled up to the time station, and I saw Jack with his leg braces and his tiny walker. And immediately, I started feeling sorry for the fact that Jack had to deal with that day at such a young age. But then he came up to me. He looked me straight in the eye with pride and confidence. He stuck to his hand for a handshake and he said, Hi, I'm Jack. I just got a trike. And you're. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your team has inspired me to ride five miles in my neighborhood for Friedrichs. A taxi I researched this summer. A hundred miles from the finish line, and, and that's what drove our team. That's what gave us the final push for the finish. A ten-year-old boy seizing his opportunity to make a move. So on June 21st, 2010, Team Farah finished the world's toughest bike race. We were, we were first in our division and 19 hours ahead of the cutoff time. Now, yeah. Now, this was a huge personal accomplishment for me, but even more, even more, it was a personal, it was a, an accomplishment for the FA community. Together, we have finished the world's toughest bikers in the face of an energy deprivation disease. If we can do this, surely we can treat and cure FA. Now, at this point, I was on staff at the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. I left my job as an engineer in Sacramento to, to be on staff and to raise awareness for FA research. And we built a program that would empower others to raise money and awareness for research. It's called Ride Ataxia, and it invites anyone to come and get involved and raise money for research through single day bike rides all around the country. Through this program, we've raised $2 million since 2007. So, very quickly, what, what have I learned from having a rare, debilitating, life-shortening disease? Well, first of all, I've learned that you've got to concentrate on the things you can do and forget about those things you can't do. Also, I've learned that it's not just about me and we'll get so much farther faster if we all put our shoulders to the wheel for a common goal. But most of all, I learned that if you don't know which direction to take, you, at the very least, you've got to make that move and make that effort to keep on moving. It all starts with that first seven miles. Thank you. <laughs>